The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next speaker is Robert Quadro Choki and he is the research and development engineer with the Elistan Corporation in Canada. And I welcome Robert. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Rob Kutrachoki from Elistan Construction in Toronto. And I'm here today to talk about a really unique application we had for using SEC technology. And that was in the repair of high-density concrete walls we use for uh, radiation shielding. Um, this is going back probably about nine years ago. So at the time, we had some experience with SEC, but more in the traditional ready-mix uh, use uh, in new construction using traditional aggregates, but never in uh, repair applications. So in 2004, we started construction on uh, Lake Ridge Health, uh, Health Center. It was a North Wing Expansion, which was a cancer care facility. It housed seven radiation therapy bunkers used to treat uh, cancer patients. Now that's a diagram of the, the bunkers, there were seven in total. The red indicates the areas that were, uh, we used high density concrete, uh, which was required for uh, obviously attenuation of the, the gamma rays to protect uh, uh, those using the equipment. There was 12 segments in all. Um, now the, the wet, specified wet density was 39 uh, 150 kilograms per cubic meter, which was uh, set as an acceptance criteria before any concrete went in the form. The dry density uh, acceptance criteria was uh, 3850 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, the rest of the walls were just regular density, but they were poured concurrently with the high density concrete uh, just to maintain the integrity of the, of the wall. So basically the high density uh, between the two concretes, there would be an expanded metal mesh or a stay form, and the high density concrete would be poured first to the lift of maximum six inches, followed by the regular density, and that would go on until the, the whole wall was full. The aggregate used for the project was, um, well, the course was a hematite aggregate from Brazil with a specific gravity of five, uh, three quarter inch nominal, and the sand was a high density beneficated hematite sand from Quebec, uh, Canada, with a specific gravity of 4.9. Uh, we had used these materials in the past on three other cancer care facilities with great success. Uh, we didn't see any issues uh, with this project. It didn't seem any more complicated than the others. And at the outrageous cost of about $1,000 per cubic meter or 760 per cubic yard, we didn't want to have anything go wrong with this, obviously. Here's the problem, however. Um, several areas uh, were severely honeycombed due to a variety of reasons. And that's the question we were asking. What's with all the honeycombing? Now, there was all kinds of fin finger pointing going on. There were several reasons, some valid, some were, uh, were not so valid. But in some, some situations, we had a low slump. Uh, the concrete didn't have the necessary flow to get in around box out areas or rebar crevices. So in some uh, instances, the slump was in excess of 160 millimeters. Uh, basically the mix segregated with the weight of the material, the weight of the aggregates, just separated from the paste. Uh, also, as I indicated earlier, um, every load was tested for density, which really slowed down the whole placing process. So that, that caused some issues as well, as well as improper consolidation, obviously with the vibrator. And the alternating lifts at the interface of the regular and high-density concrete, uh, there was an issue 
Uh, that extended, obviously, the pour uh, because you had to go back and forth with the lifts, as well as knitting, the proper knitting of the two uh, elements together. Uh, there was often joints in between the regular and the high-density concrete, and there was countless other issues that people brought up. But that didn't matter to us. We, we had the issues. It was in pretty much all the high-density walls, and we had to get it fixed. This is an example of, of improper consolidation at, the, uh, at a pour lift. And this is, as I was uh, discussing earlier, was the interface between the regular density on the right and the uh, uh, high density on the left. And proper, uh, getting that proper knitting together was, was often a challenge. Now, if this wasn't enough, dealing with all the commotion and all the repair work that had to be done, we apparently had an issue with the masons as well. So uh, we, we, uh, we had our, our hands full and everything was unraveling on the site. So take one. What was our approach? The first approach was actually recommended to us by the consultant, uh, and that was using a uh, high-density type grout with uh, a dry pack consistency. Uh, he basically uh, recommended and required that, I should say. We reluctantly agreed to do it, even though we, uh, we had issues with it, but they saw that um, with the high-density mortar in a vertical repair application, this was the best way to go. So we took a, a stab at it. The, the mix consisted of, of steel shot uh, with a specific gravity of 7.8. I believe the diameter was around 16th of an inch to an eighth of an inch. So really small. Uh, the hematite sand, again, was used with a shrinkage compensating admixture and a latex bonding agent. The repair work uh, began as, as a normal repair procedure. The, the, the areas were chipped out to sound material. Uh, the, the perimeters were, were benched at least a half inch to allow for a proper ledge for the repair. And uh, the exposed areas were power washed. It's a typical repair procedure. However, because it was high density concrete, they went through, I believe, 20 plus chipping guns, not bits, 20 guns trying to chip out all the areas. So it was a phenomenal amount of work and, and it was really, really time consuming, really affected our schedule. Um, at the bond uh, level, we basically, the bond line I should say, we added tapcons in a grid pattern and tied them with uh, tie wire just to help for that um, with the uh, shrinkage strains uh, so that we wouldn't get any debonding or delamination. Where the patch or the, uh, the uh, repair was deep enough and permitted, we installed some uh, 10M rebar as well for added shrinkage restraint as well. Now that's uh, Eric there. He was one of our lead guys performing the repairs. Essentially what he would do with this dry pack mortar was get it with a trowel and throw it at the surface and impact, impart so much energy that it would stick to the wall. So he would do this in layers, throw it up against the wall, smooth it over, trowel it over, and then do the next layer. Now obviously it's very time consuming. The quality control and the quality, overall quality of the, of the repair is suspect when you do that the filling around crevices and rebar is obviously suspect. So that's why we, we were against it to begin with. This is a, a video just to show. As you can see, because of the weight of the material, as he starts throwing it onto the surface, you'll see it actually slump over and fall over itself. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine doing this for probably over a hundred some odd repairs. <laughs> and right there, that's between a high density wall and a, and a regular density wall. So we knew, and that's Lloyd right there, we knew that there had to be a better way. We weren't going to continue on this way. Uh, sure enough, when it came to verifying the quality of the patches, the procedure that was set up was first to sound or tap the surfaces, as Shalik described earlier, with the rebar or hammer, and uh, to see if there was any hollow spots. Sure enough, there were. Um, we also uh, had um, ultrasonic pulse velocity, velocity testing performed to see if there was any voids or delaminations. Sure enough, there were. Most of the patches were rejected. We had to go to Plan B and we had to go in a hurry. Uh, our, our project was in severe uh, danger at this point. 
So take two. Now we took control. We couldn't get it wrong a third time, obviously, so we decided to use our past experience and develop some type of SEC mix using high-density uh, material to form these patches. Uh, we knew our mix had to be pourable, have high flow properties, had to optimize density, be stable. We couldn't have the steel shot and the segregate down to the bottom of the, of the repair. That wouldn't work. We had to prevent, obviously prevent and mitigate shrinkage and definitely reduce the overall labor component and, and schedule of, this, of the repairs. So basically our mix, we targeted above the normal it was 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter uh, wet density. Again with the steel shot, hematite sand, type 10 cement. This time we introduced the high range polycarboxylate admixture to help with our flowability that we'd obviously need. Uh, we introduced a viscosity modifying agent which was, uh, which was an anti, actually an anti-washout agent, as the gentleman described earlier, which was used um, primarily for underwater applications. But well, we thought we needed it with, due to the heavy weight of the, of the material, and as well uh, a shrinkage compensating admixture and a latex bonding agent. Now, due to the, obviously we needed a high paste content to get the SEC the way we wanted it to flow, but we also needed a high, there was a high paste demand in this mix because of the fineness of the high density uh, hematite sand. So we definitely had to bump it up. That's why we went to uh, uh, 720 kgs of uh, cement per cubic meter. So we got our own material. We went to site. We started playing around, doing some trials, see what would work. Um, we initially targeted a slump of about 650, 26 inch slump, which generally works well in traditional SEC and traditional aggregates, but uh, we found that while we were getting our flow, we were definitely getting segregation due to the weight of the material. So that wasn't going to work. We had to start uh, doing a trial and error process to, to see where our boundaries would be. So basically to, to increase um, our viscosity and our stability while maintaining our flow, we began reducing the water content, increased the high range polycarboxylate as well as the VMA. And we went back and forth with this a few times until we basically settled on it was about a 560 mil slump plus or minus. That's where our sweet spot was, more or less. We needed to get minimum that. Anything lower wouldn't give us the flow we needed and wouldn't really act as an SEC. Anything much higher into the 600, 650 range would definitely segregate. So we basically had to have a high level of quality control on this. At the time, too, as I said, we just started getting into SEC. We weren't measuring things like T50 and, and that kind of thing. So essentially, our slump flow was our check. We would check to see what our spread was. That would give us an indication of the flow and also the stability of, of the mix to, to see if it would segregate or not. So we batched small quantities, five liters or so, uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the repairs were often small, so we didn't want to batch too much at one time, but also we didn't want to have any impact from the time delays that that could have on the, the mix, including the flowability, and segregation potential, and all that kind of stuff. So we kept the mixes small, and we, we did it in a portable 30 liter, liter uh, mixer, a uh, masonry mixer. Uh, so basically our procedure was we buttered the mixer, mixer first, we introduced uh, sand and, uh, and the cement and the steel shot and water. Uh, spun it around a few times, got rid of the material, so we had at least a fine paste around the the mixer, so it wouldn't um, it wouldn't eat up the paste when we were actually producing it. Uh, then we added the steel shot and blended it with the cement, added the sand to the mixture. Then uh, about 90 percent or so of the of the of the water with the shrinkage reducing admixture, combined it again a couple of minutes, added the high range plus plus a, a little water combined again, added the VMA, and basically mixed until we thought the consistency was, was right. We would take a slump. If it wasn't minimum 560 or within our boundaries, we would temper it again with high range or VMA, whatever was required. So our formwork was key, and uh, a gentleman spoke about it earlier about filling it with water. I'll describe that we did that very thing. So basically, first we built these side forms tight against the, the walls with a beak or a, or a a pouring uh, uh, spout, I guess. Um, so basically, the, we wanted to pour at least three inches above the height of the patch just to ensure we covered it all. 
the perimeter of the joints were, were cocked. A perimeter of the, sorry, of the, of the form was cocked. All joints were cocked as well. We instituted a drainage port right at the bottom of the form with a plug so that we were able to fill it with water to, again, precondition the surface, but also to check the water tightness of the form. That worked really well. Before we placed it, we drained all the water and plugged it back up. Uh, so this is an example of actually the depth of our, our patches is ranged from anywhere from half inch to almost through wall. This is pretty much almost a through wall patch right here. So our sequence was we would pour, regardless of the height of the mix, generally in lifts of two or three, uh, we would pour a little, uh, tap the side form just to make sure, uh, not, basic, not to vibrate really, but just to get rid of any residual air bubbles or anything that might be trapped in there that could affect us. Um, we filled uh, again, tap until we reached our level. For larger, uh, higher patches, we'd have to segment the formwork. We'd put the pouring spot at a certain level, pour up to that height, tap, and then again place another form and work our way up that way. This is a video of uh, essentially how it was done, and we used uh, we used a bucket here as well because that's all we really could do. Well, it was kind of a logistical thing we had to... Uh... Did you use white paper? No. 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 Just tap the side of the forms. Oh, yeah. yeah. So this is just a, a few photos of some of the repairs. I know it doesn't look pretty, but trust me, it was effective. We didn't care what it looked like. It was all going to be covered with drywall anyway. Uh, but just the scale and magnitude, there was small little patches, big patches in corners, in uh, tight little uh, spots. Um, there was over, easily over 100. Uh, we lost count. For curing, we left the forms on for at least three days just to make sure we got the proper curing. After removal of the formwork, we sprayed it with a curing compound for the uh, extended cure that we, uh, that we wanted to maintain. Then the big test was the verification again. One thing we did throughout the process was take uh, mortar cubes at the beginning, at the end of the day, uh, just to monitor strength. That was never an issue with this mix. That was high in cement. Um, we, again, went through the same process as earlier. We tapped all the surfaces with a V-bar or hammer, as well as uh, after seven days of re form removal, we performed ultrasonic pulse velocity testing again. The results were fantastic. All the patches passed with flying colors, and it really saved our bacon on this job. It was we really expedited the whole process because of the SEC technology that we uh, implemented. So from that, two years after that, we uh, we were awarded a project in uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. It was another cancer facility, uh, with, again with high density concrete using the same type of materials, the hematite coarse and fine aggregate. Uh, this time around, the configurations were a little more tricky. There was box outs for mechanical duct work uh, and some other tight configurations that, and plus the fact that there was little to no experience using high density concrete on the island, we didn't want to chance it. And I don't think they had enough chipping guns on the island to, to help us in the event that we had issues. So we decided let's mitigate the risk. We developed an SEC high density mix using the, the three quarter inch aggregate. And, uh, and it worked with fine colors. We brought a bunch of material up to Toronto. It did a bunch of lab trials, uh, and trial and error. We developed a mix that worked. Um, then we went down to the island to perform a technology transfer, if you will. We met with a, two of the main ready mix producers on the island, and we worked with both of them. It was a bit of a time-consuming process and a bit of a, you know a learning curve. But eventually, we got a mix that would work. And we, again, the slump that was in the sweet spot was around 550 plus or minus 50. Um, anything above that would segregate. Anything below that, we wouldn't get the flow we needed. Um, so this is some uh, photos of some, of some of the trials. At that point, we had purchased a rheometer, the bottom right corner, to, to measure the rheological properties of the mix. And there's some uh, slump flow uh, testing as well as uh, the coarse aggregate. We went down to the island uh, just to make sure we could pour this with re forms with rebar. We, we poured a couple of mock-up columns and worked with flying colors. Fortunately, shortly after these mock-ups, there was a change in government and the project was scrapped. So 
We never got a chance to use it in full production, but at least we proved we can do it. So in summary, um, just uh, the unique challenge we had with, with performing those repairs uh, basically helped us develop to the point where we could um, design a mix of high-density uh, concrete for Trinidad and uh, develop that and transfer that over to the people on the island. And we've learned from that and built upon that in, in future years uh, since. Uh, thank you for your time. If there's any questions. We had a big challenge here. Yeah. Heavy aggregates and uh, using cell console living concrete. Any questions for uh, uh, Robert? So yes, one question. Okay. Question, but okay. Yeah. Did they ever find a better way for chipping or did they just buy a lot of guns? Yeah, there was no better way really. Yeah. <laughs> I know better. Yeah. yeah, it's iron ore. Uh, the you have the yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.